All right. So welcome to the iMedia or Interactive Media Exhibition. I have five wonderful students who have decided to create video uh, production projects and they are really good and you're in for a real treat. And before we start, I just wanna tell you how proud of all of you I am, uh, just because we have seen that production is tough, especially during these times. And you all have decided to, to you know, go against the beast and do it and complete it. So I am so proud of you uh, as you embark on your journey. Uh, so you have earned it. So we'll get started with a message from Dr. Derek LeCaf, and let me play that. Good evening, and welcome to the 12th annual exhibition of Capstone Projects from the students in the Master of Arts in Interactive Media program at Elon University. My name is Derek LeCaf, and I'm the program's faculty director. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce this very special event. Last July, these students arrived on Elon's campus, having decided to complete an intensive graduate program in the middle of a global pandemic. That alone should give you a sense of the ambition and dedication possessed by this cohort. They brought previous knowledge and skills in areas ranging from media arts to graphic design to Spanish language to dance choreography. Over the course of 10 months, they researched, designed, and produced a wide range of projects as they learned everything they could about the different domains of interactive media. This evening, the students are showcasing the most significant, ambitious, and personal projects they created in the program. These capstone projects began with intensive audience and user research, were designed to achieve specific goals, and were professionally produced and developed across multiple user-tested drafts and prototypes. As you'll see, the content of these projects is incredibly diverse and vibrant, but every capstone reflects a shared commitment to design principles and understanding of production process. I know you will enjoy these presentations, and I encourage you to engage with these projects and the students afterwards. Each of these polished projects is the end point of a long journey. Each student overcame different challenges and made hard decisions to bring an excellent project to fruition. And now, at the end, they're very excited to share these stories. All right. So what we'll do, we'll start with each student's presentation. We have five students up. And we will start with Jasmine uh, Simmons, who is bringing Fit Burn Fitness. The floor is yours, Jasmine. Thank you, Mr. Booker. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now with you all. Hello everybody, my name is Jasmine Simmons and for my capstone of 2021, I created an interactive workout video entitled Fit Burn Fitness. So today I'll be going over my proposal, the workouts, my talent and location, production, pre-production, post-production, using the Echo platform and my experience overall. So the objective of Fit Burn Fitness is to create an interactive workout video that gives you a total body workout experience without ever leaving the comfort of your home. This is one of a kind as users are allowed to pick which workout they wanna do and guide their own experience. I designed this for people who are high risk of COVID-19 or they can't afford a gym membership or they're just looking for a more personal trainer experience without the personal trainer price. So here is a persona, and that is to discuss the target audience who I'm trying to reach and also let you know some frustrations that users have experienced with other workout equipment or YouTube videos or mobile applications or things that just cost a little bit more money. Um, applications most people use are like a Nike Run app, MyFitnessPal, or also a MyZone. So the workouts were designed by a good friend of mine and personal trainer by the name of Reggie Glenn. He is the owner of Trifecta Fitness. He has over 10 years of workout experience. Um, these workouts that he created are for people of all ages and do not require any equipment. And if when done consecutively and with a balanced diet, you can get good results. 
So next I'm gonna take you through the target areas. So we have abs, you're given crunches and Russian twists to do. For your legs, you're given lunges and squats. For your arms, you are given bicep curls and tricep kickbacks. For your back, you're given bent over rows and Goldbergs. And then for the chest, you're given chest flies and push-ups. Again, at the bottom, as it states, um, do four sets of 15 reps to receive maximum results. So how I met my talent and location prior to joining the iMedia program, I was a relationship specialist at the YMCA of Northwest North Carolina. And that is where I met good friend and colleague, Adam Cardwell. He is the senior regional director of wellness for the YMCA of Northwest North Carolina. Um, and just due to a good rapport that I've kept with senior faculty and staff and just other colleagues, I was able to shoot at the YMCA and Adam volunteered to be my talent. So now I'm just going to take you a little through my process. So for pre-production, I had to write a script. Um, this assured that the video flowed in order and also helped guide my talent throughout the way. I also created a shot list. This assured that I captured angles that such as close up, wide shot, and middle angle as well. I also went to the location to take photos and that allowed me to see the space that I'd be working with and also look at the lighting. For my production, I had one assistant during shooting. Um, it took us about two hours to set up our equipment and we only had an hour and 45 minutes to shoot the entire production. For post-production, I used Adobe Premiere Pro to edit my projects and I was able to get my music from Firstcom, which is a public domain free media platform. And I housed the, um, my workout video in the Echo platform all right, so why did I choose Echo? Because it delivers a cinematic interactive video experience that empowers users to make stories and shape stories in real time. Um, these workouts give you the opportunity to not, all, not only give you a personal trainer experience, but also guide you through each workout. During the workout, um, you're given advice like go at your own pace, um, staying hydrated, they give you alternative moves, and you are just encouraged throughout the entire workout to keep going. So my experience, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Sorry, let me pause this. So I documented my experience um, through several um, apps, TikTok being one of them. When I first started um, shooting, I did use Reginald Glenn as my talent and use his gym trifecta fitness. But after going through my footage, I realized some things weren't aesthetically pleasing, such as color, lighting. I also wasn't able to capture a uh, shallow depth of field for him on the film. I felt like he was too boxed in. So that lead me to go reshoot. So I'm going to play a video just going over my reshoot that I created on iMovie. Hey guys, here is just a brief overview of my capstone reshoot. Everything went great. As you can see, there I am on set. And then within an hour and 45 minutes, we started the breakdown process. Everything went great and needless to say, the videos turned out perfect. And over the weekend, I also met with my mentor, Gardy, who gave me some really good suggestions, tips and tricks on what to use on my videos and how to split them up. Also, we did a brief overview of the Echo platform. And as you can see, um, it's a really easy platform to use. I have a lot of good advice and good feedback. So what I learned, and just a little overview, so I learned don't be afraid to start over. Um, being that I had that footage already with Reggie, I was kind of skeptical to start the process over because I only had two weeks to find a new talent, also secure a new location. But if I was scared to start this process, then I would have never gotten my great footage that I have now for my capstone, and it wouldn't turn out as good as it did.
Um, never be afraid to ask for help or advice. Um, I talked to several people within the cohort, got editing advice. I also reached out to iMedium alum who gave me some really good advice like Guardi and just kind of helped me flow through the Echo platform and just any other questions that I had. And last but not least, um, no idea is a bad idea um, because it's yours. So no matter what you think, you just have to trust yourself and trust the process and just trust your ideas and just make them come true. Um, and if you want to check out Fitburn Fitness, it is located on the Echo platform. Um, I would advise using Firefox just because so far that is the best web browser to use um, when viewing it on Echo. And I will also drop the link in the chat. But um, thank you so much, guys, for tuning in to my capstone and check out Fitburn Fitness. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jasmine. Hey, great work. Great work. You ran into some hiccups, but you prevailed. And that's that's all that counts. All right. Thank so you. good job. So next, we'll have Rooted Crowns by Megan Chalmers. Thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen with you all. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I'm Megan Chalmers, and I'll be giving you all some insight to my interactive documentary called Rooted Crowns. Rooted Crowns is a project that is near and dear to my heart because I can relate to so many of the challenges and misperceptions that the women of color that women of color face with their natural hair. This documentary allows viewers to interact with it while they are watching by taking a path through history of black hair and through the interviews from women who have natural hair, work in corporate settings and are hairstylists and students. Rooted Crown shows women from different employment backgrounds to show how hair discrimination affects many Black women. Not every state has laws that protect natural hair, so it's still legal to turn people away because of their hair in many states. My project has a call to action for viewers to sign the Crown Act petition. The Crown Act is a law that was created in 2019 by Dove and the Crown Coalition to ensure protection against race-based hair discrimination. This law protects hair textures and styles such as locks, twists, and knots in the, work, knots in the workplace and public schools. Um, when I created this, I went through three, three processes and those three processes include the pre-production stage, the production process, and the post-production. So in the pre-production process, you'll see here that I created a schedule to keep myself on task. Um, this was a little bit hard because during that time I had went through um, where I had tested positive for COVID. So I was, I had to change my schedule around a lot. And during that time I had to start working on stuff like for post-production stuff, start working on my logo. I started rescheduling interviews because I had so many interviews lined up during that time um, but I had to reschedule all of those and of course during the pandemic it's already hard to get uh, people to talk to an interview because of you know CDC guidelines and of course COVID um, so I ended up rescheduling half of those people back to have interviews with me I created my logo I sketched out a user journey map for echo and I collected artifacts for the history portion of my project and as you see I have about seven interviewees here um, I started out with 14 before COVID uh, before I had got COVID and then I ended it with seven, but that was still good enough because it made for a lot of content that, I, that had to be edited. And I also, before I started, um, before I started making schedules, I also created a persona. This persona, um, as you see, Janelle, she works for a, a huge Fortune 500 company. Um, she gets frustrated because of hair discrimination, seeing little black girls on the news being turned around from school, like the one in Louisiana. Um, she was turned around because he, she had box braids in her hair and they told her that it was very distracting at a school. Um, not knowing how to do or wear her hair and just having a uh, negativity associated with her natural hair. Um, she wanted something, she was looking for a documentary or something that she can look to to share experiences with women or 
um, get experiences from other women and just different techniques on how to do her hair and how she can wear her hair and make it look good. And then here I have a brand guide for my interactive documentary. I started out with about three colors. I have purple and gold, which is the one I ended up with. And then I have blue and gold and I have green and brown. Um, I wanted to go with something that stood for royalty or show royalty. And so I ended up not doing the green and brown option just because they were a little nude and they didn't have a, a royalty feel to them. Um, and then I was gonna go with blue and gold, but the only reason why I didn't choose the blue is because I did some talking to some women and they said they would feel more comfortable with the purple and gold. And also because purple is more of a feminine color, a lot of women geared more towards that. I also started off with a couple fonts. I had some sans serif fonts and uh, serif fonts, and I also had script. I ended up going with script because it was more it felt more like royalty as well. And then I also had some crowns down here and I chose between these crowns by mixing them up. I decided to go with the bottom left and the bottom right and I mixed them up. And this is the final crown that I ended up uh, using right here. So I, I went with the purple and gold and then this crown uh, that I made using Adobe Illustrator. And then I also had to make interview questions during this time. Um, so in this list of questions, you'll see that I asked a lot of lighthearted questions, but right here in the middle, uh, I went in and got some harder questions like, you know, do you feel like you wear your, your hair a certain way because of where you work? Have you ever been told to change your hair by an employer? And if so, tell me about that time. And like, what do you hear from non-minorities when you hear, wear your hair naturally? Um, I asked a lot of these questions because I know women face a lot of challenges when it comes to stuff like this, especially at work and in places where they are where they are the minority. A lot of people don't understand our hair, so they tend to frown upon it because they don't have that hair or they don't understand it. But that's what the Crown Act is for. So when people do see your hair and they don't understand it, they can't turn you away from that. And that's why one of the main causes of action is to um, sign the petition. And when you scroll on my website, you'll see that there's a place right here that says be a part of the change. And you can click here and it will take you to sign the petition. So that way you can um, fill out the form. You can read a little bit about where the petition is coming from um, and who's already signed it. And if you wanna sign it and then you can forward it to other people as well. Um, also, Excuse me. The second stage was the production process. So during the production process, I used the Canon 7D Mark II um, and I used Generate Lights and I used the Zoom Recorder. And then for post-production, this was one of the most important and strenuous parts of creating this documentary because during post-production while I was editing, I started to notice that some of the audio had sounded distorted and some of the audio was usable and some of it was not. So I ended up having to take some of the sound from the camera and cleaning that up and trying to clean up the audio from uh, the Zoom recorder up as best as I could. Not all of the in interviews came out bad on the Zoom recorder, but just a couple of them. And of course, you know, when you have hiccups like that, it's, it's frustrating, but I was able to overcome it by using it by using this Canon um, audio. And then I also use music from First Calm, um, which has free music on there that you'll hear in the background of some of the interviews as well as the history. And then I use Adobe After Effects to create my Rooted Crowns logo. And you'll see whenever you watch the documentary that you'll see the, the rooted crowns being spelled out like it's written and that was created in After Effects. And I also used um, the platform Echo. Um, and this just allows you to make interact, make your videos interactive by adding like clickable buttons. And this is where my user journey map came in at. Um, this was another hiccup that I had because using Echo, it didn't allow for a lot of options in the beginning. So I had to switch it up to where it's only two options. And you guys will see that whenever you click on the documentary, it's only two options instead of a lot of options to, 
a lot of routes to take. Um, but I was able to figure that out to where you can take a route and each user will be able to go through whichever way they want and still complete the, 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 the process, the journey. And so um, I really enjoyed creating this documentary. It made me realize a lot of things about myself. It made me implement my critical thinking skills and made me very, uh, it made me more resourceful. Um, I learned to always test out my tools multiple times before using them to always be resilient even through the storm. And I think that's the biggest thing that I learned out of this project. And I just appreciate you all for joining. And I hope you guys have time to view my documentary on the web, on my website. And I'll drop the, drop the link for you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. Great work and great in-depth research. And I'm gonna go sign that petition, all right? So next who we have, we have Picturing Sound by Ben Winslow. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Booker. And I'll uh, share my screen now. So today I'm gonna to talk about my capstone presentation and the project that I worked on for a second semester in the spring. Um, I basically had the pleasure of working with a newly formed band um, of Elon seniors. Um, and I had had a relationship with one of them and um, basically our interest aligned in that I needed um, a, a project to get passionate about and, um, and unveil my skills with and they were dying for content to be released to their fans that they'd kind of established already pre prior to the pandemic and with um inability to have live concerts or get any gigs in that sort of way wanted to present them an opportunity to um to give their their audience um content to to ex expand their name and their popularity so I'm going to take you through the process and um, multiple things that I learned about along the way. And so this is all starting back in January. Um, I had just seen them kind of practicing in the backyard and obviously not much production value went into here, but I, I think it's cool to just see this very beginning stages of me just pointing a camera at the span at the band and kind of seeing how our talents can um, how our talents can can match with each other and maximize something beneficial for both of us. Um, and for, starting from this, uh, based upon getting confirmation from my capstone professor, um, we went, got to work with starting creating me, creative meetings um, with me and the team. And it, we went through multiple evolutions of what exactly we we're gonna create, right? And um, the, the project as a whole, the idea was to create a, um, excuse me, the, the project project was to create a um, interactive virtual um, album, right? And we started off thinking of doing many um, cover, cover songs that people around Elon and people uh, familiar with their band would really get excited about them playing. Um, and so I was going to do multiple music videos of um, cover, cover songs. Um, you know, we had bi-weekly meetings with our um, capstone classes and through just um, the evolution of the process and uh, through going to more creative meetings and kind of um, setting up the project for myself, um, realized uh, significant obstacles in the way of doing uh, cover cover songs. And um, this was kind of the, the, the start in the shift of, of my project. Um, to doing more originals that um, the band actually had produced themselves um, and then kind of giving me a way to um, use my talents to, to help them get these songs off the ground and actually create something um, brand new. And um, so, you know, th there was a, um, there was storyboards created for, um, three different uh, songs that was um, originally tapered down to two. So the um, ambitions of the project really did kind of narrow themselves um, as I um, just shifted my focus and tried to um, implement as much as I could on those two videos. And so it was two videos that, that they had produced um, 
the songs for. And basically I could then turn and create a, a housing um, platform to uh, house these um, interactive music videos um, to which there were, there were two. And so this was kind of the start of, of my end of the project of production um, leading into post-production. And so obviously that, that starts um, on, and so obviously, you know, if you're gonna um, combine those three into two, which I did, and it was a shift during the time of production. So I ended up putting more pressure on myself editing, um, but it ended up uh, working out in the end, given that I had um, like uh, more to, to work with on that end. And obviously um, this starts from the creative side and also just the organizational side of project management of being on set um, to which I was on set eight days in two months. Um, I had three different um, assistants um, kind of shifting in and out, um, but, I, but I was seemingly the, you know, the, the most experienced and the one really connected to the creative side and the organizational side of this project. So it really, everything did fall on my shoulders and it really was my first experience of kind of being that director on a set. Um, and to be honest, I, I got better at it each time I did it. Um, in the beginning, you know, it, it was a lot of hands on deck and um, it was, it, it took a while for me to get through my shot lists. And then I just, I just noticed that um, each time I went back, it was more smooth and um and made made for a better experience overall um and so i think i they, they got more and more valuable um each each time i was on set and so obviously reflecting on this project um i gotta be like honest about the things that i i grew from and the things that i was really um really positive at and the things that i need to to improve upon. And obviously, um, just in general, the file management started to be so overwhelming because of all the content that I was producing for this, for these videos. Um, everything from um, introduction animations to um, light presets and um, downloadable plugins to be altered. Um, it was a lot of, a lot of working between different Adobe programs, um, Illustrator to After Effects, and then all collectively uh, flow into Premiere. And so I think just um, if I were to do this project again, starting from the get go to kind of organize these files, I think um, would give me an easier um, situation um, in, in post production, which obviously was um, it was overwhelming for this project and it, and it really did um, take, take a lot of hours to do. And um, another part of it is just the um, graphics in general, I think should be going hand in hand um, with the production um, process. Whereas I was solely focused on production and then turned to post-production. And so I think that there kind of can be a little bit of a bleed between those, the, those two times, uh, depending on the scheduling in the project. And so, as I said, it really was a, um, an evolution from um, Illustrator, which was the inception and the creation of, these, of, of this content to the um, conversion of, of video to the animation and um, changing um, timelines. So um, really there were, there were three um, separate parts of this project and they really did have um, specific challenges and specific outcomes. But I think um, giving, giving more, more time on the post edit, which I, which I did have, it kind of allowed me to fill the holes in that I had um, pre-production based on the, um, the stark change that I'd made um, earlier on in my evolution of the project from uh, three covers to two originals. I think the final result ended up um, speaking for itself and being a lot better and more true to their artistry and showing their kind of work um, as opposed to maybe what my perceptions of it was. 
And, um, you know, just in general, I think that I've, I've benefited so much um, with my project management skills, as well as just dealing with different types of uh, people and obstacles and the holistically um, rounded ways in which I, I improved my um, professional capabilities in this is really um, just the start of what kind of big projects um, you can you can c- complete when um, you put your mind to it and have um, realistic and professional expectations of yourself. Um, so I hope that you guys can check out the um, two music videos that I produce on my um, my my housing um, platform. And um, with that, I thank you, and I will turn it back over. All right, great work, Ben. It's not easy doing all those effects and after effects. So uh, great work and great perseverance there. All right, next we will have Mind Over Matter by Michael Boyd. All right. All right. So can everybody hear me? Okay. All right. Uh, Good evening, everyone. Uh, My name is Michael Boyd, and today I will be presenting my capstone project, which is called Mind Over Matter, a Black Men um, Mental Health Documentary. So a little about Mind Over Matter. So Mind Over Matter is an interactive documentary that sheds light on Black men's mental health concerns in America. So some of the topics that were talked about within the documentary, um, we talked about trauma, whether it was like generational trauma uh, or childhood trauma. Uh, We talked about anxiety. We talked about um, depression, inequality, um, the representation of Black men um, in media or just in communities. We talked about therapy and the benefits of it. And we talked about police brutality and much more. Also, this is a QR code where you can um, view uh, Mind Over Matter. And also I put the link to the video in the chat box. So for Mind Over Matter, um, I created the video in Premiere Pro. And once I was done, that's when I transported everything into uh, Echo Studio to get the interactive part of it. So how did I come up with Mind Over Matter? Um, So the phrase Mind Over Matter was brought to my attention by another student who was also presenting their project today. She pretty much told me that she think it would be a very good fit for my film, whether it was the um, title or not. So I thought about it and I went home and I did like a deeper like research of like what does matter of a matter means. And the meaning of it is pretty much when someone is able to control a condition or problem by using their mind, the ability to keep going even when tired is a simple question of mind of a matter. So some of the motivations and inspirations behind this documentary, um, first and foremost, um, definitely comes from my upbringing. Um, In my community, I'm from a small little town that's in the eastern part of North Carolina. And in that town, um, many of the African-American men, they don't really um, pursue their dreams. They just kind of just settle and just let time and life just go by. So most of those men, I kind of know them and I have been able to like, you know, talk to them and just get like input of like what they're thinking. And I definitely wanted to highlight that within my documentary. Um, bef- before coming to our media, um, I was a middle school teacher. So I got to work with um, different uh, African-American um, young, young males and just to just um, hear about their life and see what they go through on a daily basis and just mentor them. Um, I wanted to incorporate that as well within my documentary to show um, positive representation and also just talking to different family and friends. And some of the podcasts that I listen to, um, most of them are on YouTube. One of them was called Mental Health Podcast by Regina Howard. And another one was called Common Sense Podcast. And again, that's all on YouTube. And the most popular one is called The Therapist on YouTube. 
All right, so I just want to highlight um, the cast of Mind Over Matter. So of course you have me. I did give like a little input in this documentary. Um, you have Mr. Shafi Powell, who is a therapist in Greensboro, North Carolina. You have Mr. Madario Lamp Lampkins, who is also a therapist in Greensboro. And then we have Mr. Noah Le Leggett, who has worked with um, students for a long period of time. We also have Mr. William Thomas, who is a teacher and a mentor. And we also have Mr. Patrick Jones, who is a community activist. All right, so my process in completing this documentary, so I broke it up into three sections. I had the pre-production section, the production section, and the post-production. And in my pre-production, I was able to just develop different ideas, plans, um, storyboarding. I started to like schedule different um, interviews. I started to get different equipment and try to figure out different locations for my bureau. Um, once that was done, that's when I went to my production. And with production, I was able to, you know, start my filming and recording. Um, once production was done, I went to post-production. And that was pretty much just editing the video, uh, working on music and audio, um, voiceovers, sounds, colors. That was pretty much the longest part. All right, and some of the artifacts that I made for this documentary, um, the first one that I did was a persona to just kind of show like who would be my target audience for this um, film. I also created different interview questions for the interviewees, and I also created a shot list for um, my different B-roll shots. Uh, once I pretty much had went over and looked back at the um, footage I had got, uh, I was able to create like a story map and kind of decide like how I wanted my story to flow. And also I was able to send out a quick survey to different people to just um, ask them, you know, um, did they have any input they would like to give me? Um, what were their suggestions and what, what did they think about uh, about the topics I have already selected and was there anything that I was missing that needed to be added or taken out. So some of the takeaways from um, doing this documentary, uh, when it comes down to production, um, I always have a backup plan. Uh, I can tell you now a lot of things went wrong. Um, a lot of things that I wanted to happen just couldn't happen due to COVID. So I just had to think quick. Um, another thing was to like overly prepare. So having those extra batteries, um, having that extra light kit, uh, you might think it, it may be too much, but honestly, it wasn't. You needed that stuff. Um, also, just be patient. Um, at one point in time, I felt myself just trying to rush because, you know, time was ticking, but you just have to just be patient with the whole process. Uh, another takeaway was to just make sure the interviewees are comfortable. Um, I realized, you know, once they was comfortable around you, you just get more uh, information from them. Um, another thing that another takeaway was um, creating a YouTube series. So with this documentary, it's broken up into six different parts. So it was brought to my attention, you know, just release um, one section, maybe um, a week on YouTube. So I'm thinking about doing that as well. Uh, some of the skills that I improved on was my interviewing skills, um, video editing skills, uh, storytelling skills, production skills, and my organization skills. All right, so I do want to just show like a quick glimpse of like what to expect um, from um, this documentary. Again, this is just one part. So I hope you enjoy. When you start talking about trauma, you have to really understand what is trauma. So trauma can basically be defined as an emotional response or a physical response to what someone would consider a traumatic event. Honestly, like I just lost interest for everything. Like, I don't know, like my attention was just not on things that need to be on. I started to lose things that were important, like not focusing on what I had going on. I lost my apartment, 
Like I just because I lost everything, you know. I lost some stuff that I put in storage. When I lost my storage after losing my apartment, so it was just like you know I was losing that. And then I dropped out of school, you know. So it was just it was really taking a toll on like everything. All right, so I don't want to waste too much time on it, but you can definitely view it on my portfolio. And also, before I end this presentation, um, I just want to let everyone know that May is the month for mental health awareness. So um, just a reminder that well, for you or anybody that you know that you are not alone in a situation, if you need anybody to talk to, there are people out there that are waiting for you to just, you know, find them and talk to them. And also I have provided like a different link and um, a helpline number that you can get in contact with just in case if you want to talk to somebody. All right, and you can find me on LinkedIn at microrboard1. Um, my email is board.michael20 at gmail.com. And also you can view my portfolio at microrboard1.com. And that is where you would find um, Mind Open Matter. And again, um, just thank you for watching and listening to my presentation today. All right, great work, Michael. Um, I think this is a topic that a lot of people don't talk about. So thank you for researching this and sharing it. Very powerful uh, stuff there. All right, so last but not least, we have Lights, Cameras, Options by Dion Cummings. Appreciate that, Professor Booker. Let me share my screen real quick. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. My name is Dion Cummings and my uh, Capstone project is Lights, Camera Options, an interactive storytelling experience combining video production and immersive technology. Um, so before we get into the actual process, I want to give a bit of background information about the actual production itself. It's titled Therapeutic, which is an ori original series that I am writing, um, highlighting the fluidity of healing and growth. Uh, so it really ties in personally to me, to my creative philosophy, which is empathetic connectivity. I believe that empathy can be used as an engine for storytelling and is the best way to make impacts to not only the characters, but also to the audience. Uh, so prior to my pre-production phase, I actually did a little bit of audience research. Um, I created some surveys, which I shared across multiple, ah, multiple <laughs> social media platforms, just to get a better understanding of what the audience wants, um, not only from their preferences standpoints with television and film, but also their interactive standpoints and what their exposure to interactive video has been. Afterwards, I conducted some user testing um, with myself and several participants using the echo interface and uh, picking a chosen production. We all went through the interface and gave our own interactions and collected qualitative data afterwards. Um, from there, I made three different distinctions. One that I would use echo as my interface of choice, uh, just mostly because of the simplicity of it, not just from a viewer standpoint, but also from a creative standpoint. Second would be the range of options when using echo. Um, I found that users actually don't like having just two options because it gives them the imposition that they are making a right or wrong choice as opposed to they also don't have like having too many excessive options as it creates a little bit of confusion within the storyline. So I found three to be the perfect number. And then with the time frame of the actual videos, I found that eight to 13 minutes is most appropriate because viewers don't like to sit during long durations of time when uh, dealing with interactive videos because it gets a bit of a burnout effect. Um, afterwards, I would transition straight into the pre-production phase. Now, my original concept for my story uh, it was a bit more expansive. Uh, it actually included seven different characters, seven different storylines. Uh, for the sake of time and the scope of this project, I had to scale that down tremendously. Uh, so I spent a lot of different feedback sessions, uh, a lot of brainstorming sessions, just scaling down the idea of what I actually wanted to do um, before I actually started getting into the actual script writing of the entire project. Um, to kind of aid with the character development, in, including the character bios, I actually sat down with a therapist and some social workers and got a little bit of insight between their interactions with actual clients how those actual um, interactions perceive, how some of the client's interactions and mannerisms, such as the way they speak, uh, eye language and body language and things of that nature. And from doing that, they helped me create the character bios, which I would give to my actors. And from there, I transitioned into writing storyboards to kind of help get the idea of how I kind of wanted the actual production to be perceived. Um, because I'm pretty passionate about representation in front and behind the camera, I purposely recruited an entire Black cast, but also an implied back clue to help me actually produce the entire thing. Um, some of these are people from Elon, and especially my lead actor. My lead actors are actually Elon students here in the Performing Arts Center. 
Um, and because I had a primarily uh, black cast, I actually took extra measures to make sure that whenever I shot everything, I did light testing. So I spent about six to seven days actually, and thank you again, Dr. Booker for <laughs> being a volunteer on that, with helping me figure out um, how to capture lighting appropriately for different actors and actresses across different skin tones. I think understanding the different variations of that can uh, immensely improve your production values. So I really took that to excessive measures. Um, afterwards, I transitioned right into the production phase. Now, um, coming out of the pre-production, I did run into some barriers. Uh, while writing my script, my computer actually crashed. So I was uh, without a computer for roughly about 15 days. Um, to kind of get by that, I actually wrote on anything that I can find from pieces of paper, uh, using notes apps to using chalkboards and taking pictures of them just to record some of my lines. Um, so during this time frame, I kept storyboarding, I kept compiling all of my notes together. Uh, so when we came back and my computer was fixed, I actually had a short amount of time to actually rush through the production process. So our actual process uh, took nine days in total. We did three days of voice recording. Um, the first few days would just be run throughs. And then the last day we do feedback sessions where we kind of listen to each other talk and then give input onto how the actual uh, shoot is going to go. So they have a better idea of coming into the actual production, how they're supposed to be acting out some of those scenes. Um, then transitioning from those, we had three days of indoor shooting and then three, to three days of outdoor shooting. Um, this would all be concluded with me going into the post-production phase, which mostly I focused on just quality checking a lot of my work, um, doing some testing within the Echo interface, and then also running some social media promotions by taking tidbits of my videos and posting them on different social media channels just to give people more aware of what the project consisted of. Uh, some additional tools that I did use throughout the process um, that definitely <laughs> made my life easier can include Pluralize. It's a tool that instantly syncs audio and video files together and allows you to export them directly into a timeline. Uh, given the fact that I didn't have a lot of time frame with uh, my post-production work, um, coming from just not having a computer, I really had to think of ways to actually get bypass this barrier. Uh, an additional tool was Artist.io, which provided me with a lot of royalty-free music that was also incorporated in kind of getting the better feel and the tone of the video. And one in particular was Shot Deck, which I want to highlight on this page here which is something I used to really help me understand the aesthetic of the lighting and the different editing features that I kind of want to go into, especially with the touch up. Um, so Shot Deck is a wide gallery of displays that showcases different scenes and variations from movies and TV shows, but it also breaks them down by some of the uh, proper things when going about and through the post-production process, such as the time of day, aspect ratio, composition, lighting type, and other things like that. This greatly helped me figure out the type of mood and setting that I want to get and the type of feel um, for my particular production. And then afterwards, I would incorporate everything into Echo, which you can see Echo is a pretty simplistic to use. Um, it's pretty much a drag and drop format to where you upload all of your videos on the left-hand side and then you would create the timeline here. Uh, and then as you just kind of drag and drop them onto the thing, you can actually see a display within the top left corner that allows you to actually play the video and get a better preview of how it's actually gonna work. Um, I do have a quick snippet I was going to play as I conclude this for just a couple seconds. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cool. I'm here. Good. Glad to know you're here. Uh, we were talking about the reason behind you being here. Here? In my office. In therapy. Yes. Therapy. Do you think that you're here because you need to be? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I would say I need to be here. So when incorporating interactivity into my project, it definitely influenced the way I was writing and actually shooting things. I had to think of uh, how to make the story cohesive no matter what was happening. So a lot of the times the way, uh, based on my creative philosophy and with the interactivity, I chose to use a lot of the interactive moments whenever the therapist was asking a question. Um, just because subconsciously the question now comes into the audience mind and it feels like they're more into the session than the actual character is. Um, so by doing that throughout the whole thing, I actually felt like it gave more of an impactful presence and allowed the, uh, the viewers to get more immersed into the actual uh, storyline. But that concludes my project. Uh, you can find Therapeutic on Echo, but you can also find it housed within my capstone uh, portion of my project here within my portfolio. Thank you. All right, great work, Dion. I like how you uh, focused a lot on lighting and you did research for a fictional story, which was uh, amazing, man. 
So that concludes all of our five participants here. Uh, we will open up the floor to the chat if anyone has a comment or something that they would like to ask um, before we close. And you can type it in the chat or you can uh, speak out loud if you have anything. second. All right. Well, it seems like we don't have any questions, but so I guess we will start to close, but I want to just express my appreciation for, for all of you um, on tackling this challenge. You know, you chose a tough field already. It's already tough, but then with COVID and protocols and we saw all that, uh, in class, but but you all did great. You know, you you ran into your challenges, but you pivoted and you you came out with something better, and that's perseverance. So I want to thank all of you for the hard work that you have done. Y'all have been a, a wonderful class. I think I had all of you during the, the the spring semester, so it's been a pleasure watching all of you uh, grow as filmmakers and storytellers, and watch your skills develop and watch. Uh, these projects blossom. So I just want to tell you how extremely proud of you I am. And as you go into your professional life and your professional journey, the real world is coming. Uh, feel free to reach out. If I can ever help you in any type of way, feel free. I know how to how to reach me and I'll give you my, my number too if you if you need to shoot me a text. All right. Um, but I just want to say I'm I'm extremely proud of all of you and you earned it and your big day is tomorrow and I'm proud of you, all right? Cool. So y'all should all give yourselves a clap, all right? Well, that concludes uh, the video production uh, section of um, the iMedia Capstone uh, exhibition. So thank you all for coming and thank you to the participants. Y'all did an amazing job, all right?